cultivating partnerships, in-row weed control options for farmers large and small. As part of a generous grant through North Central SARE, the Brainerd Lab at Michigan State University has worked over the last year to gather valuable information on past and current knowledge on in-row weed control. This video series is the culmination of that effort. In early 2017, the Brainerd Lab, along with three Midwestern vegetable farmers, visited with researchers, manufacturers, and farmers in Switzerland, France, and the Netherlands, and learned how they effectively use mechanical weed control machines that are largely produced in those regions. The information on the Flextine cultivator, finger weeder, and torsion weeder provided in these videos come from applied research done by the Brainerd Lab, trials of our farmer partners carried out over the 2017 growing season, and the information we gathered through our travels in Europe. We hope that the expert advice we share here will assist growers in the U.S. in both choosing the best equipment for their system and using it effectively. The original finger weeder was developed and patented by the Budding Weeder Company in Michigan in the 1950s, and the basic concept hasn't changed much since then. Flexible fingers driven by tines mounted below each unit uproot or bury small weeds in and near the crop row. Here, you can see the finger weeder in action in transplanted cabbage on a vegetable farm we visited in Switzerland. Modern versions of the finger weeder are made of plastics with various diameters, levels of hardness, and mounting systems. The most important part of using in-row cultivation tools effectively is the setup and calibration of that tool for your specific conditions. Adjustments can vary widely depending on crop, weed pressure, soil type, and climate. Making sure to set aside space and time to understand the tool and make adjustments to optimize the tool's effectiveness for different conditions will help you get the most out of your investment. Hi, my name is Dan Brainerd. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Horticulture at Michigan State University. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about finger weeders. There are three ways to kill a weed, slice, uproot, or bury. The finger weeder can do two out of those three depending how you have it set. Uh, if your crop is taller than the weed, burial or hilling is a good approach. If your crop has stronger rooting than a weed, setting it to uproot uh, can also work well. In our studies, we sometimes plant golf tees to mimic weeds and see what the fingers are doing. Here, we have the fingers angled backwards slightly, which results in weeds being uprooted and flicked out of the crop row. In other cases, when the soil is loosened in front of the fingers and the fingers pitched forward slightly, soil can be pushed into the row to bury short weeds. Finger weeders are most commonly and easily used in transplanted crops, like this lettuce we're looking at. This was transplanted about 10 days ago. Once it's established and the roots have anchored the crop reasonably well, you can come through fairly aggressively and take out the first flush of weeds. Uh, much more challenging to manage weeds in a direct seeded crop like sugar beets because the weeds are going to germinate about the same time as the crop and it's going to be difficult to uproot or bury the weeds without also uprooting or burying the crop. Other crops that work well with the finger weeder uh, beyond the transplanted crops if you have a direct seeded, larger seeded crop like sweet corn, snap beans or squash. They often come up fast enough and are well rooted enough that you can run the finger weeder through there relatively early and catch those weeds in white thread or cotyledon stage. Most growers would first run a flex tine, maybe just before those large seeded crops come out of the ground. And then again, five or 10 days after they've come up and they're well established. And then there'd be an opportunity to come through with the finger weeder on the next pass. So the finger weeder is uh, primarily an in-row tool, so we're targeting getting weeds in that narrow strip right where the crop is planted. And like all the tools that we've talked about, uh, there's no magic to this. You really need to have a size difference between the crop and the weed. And so a transplanted lettuce crop like this has pretty good size. This was transplanted about 10 days ago. And if you look at the weeds that are coming up, most of them are considerably smaller, so this would be a good opportunity 
to use a finger weeder, or torsion weeder, or some of the other tools. One of the key things in using any of these tools is having the appropriate soil moisture conditions. It can really make a big difference in how effectively they work. Uh, we have a field here that's got a little wave to it. You can see parts of the field got a rain last night. This is way too wet to effectively use the finger weeders. They'll plug the tines. The weeds have enough moisture to regrow, so that's not great. Uh, other parts of the field, conditions might be too dry, and you can get kind of crusting and the fracturing of the soil and little weeds might move around a little bit, but they're not gonna die, they're gonna reroot. And so we really like to run these tools around field capacity, so not too wet, not too dry, uh, to get the most effective action. One other piece of this is uh, sometimes combining finger weeders with other tools helps to deal with some of these problems. So if you have this situation where you've got a fractured piece with some weeds still on it, you can imagine if you ran a a rolling budding basket weeder over it or something like a, another sweep off the back or a flex tine, you can knock some of that soil off and get a higher percentage of the weeds to die. In our trials at Michigan State University, we have evaluated the impact of finger weeders in combination with flex tine weeders in both carrots and snap beans. In several cases, we have found that we kill more weeds without damaging the crop when these tools are combined or stacked compared to when they are used alone. For example, this figure shows the effect of a flex tine cultivator on mortality of beans, red root pigweed, lamb's quarters, and annual grass weeds. You can see that the flex tine cultivator did little damage to beans, black bar, and did okay on pigweed and lamb's quarters, but wasn't too effective on grasses. In comparison, the finger weeder did very well in pigweed and grasses, but didn't kill all of the lamb's quarters. When we combined the two implements, we had almost 100% success on weeds, with minimal damage to beans. This combination doesn't always work this perfectly, but when soil conditions are just right and we time it well, we have had great success. To make these tools work effectively, it's, fairly, it's very important to try to have as uniform a stand as possible. Uh, we, we're in a squash uh, planting here that was done with a push seeder. Maybe the depth wasn't quite perfect. We've got maybe our tillage in preparation for planting wasn't perfect, so there's some variation in moisture. And the effect of that is we've got some squash that's just coming up and would not tolerate finger weeding very well at all. Uh, some squash intermediate, and then once we get a first true leaf, we've been able to go through with a finger weeder very slowly. One of the nice things about the finger weeder, in contrast to other in-row tools, such as the torsion weeder, is its ability to perform reasonably well even when there is residue in the field. Here, you can see the finger weeder in action in a transplanted cabbage crop that was planted into a strip-tilled field that had a winter rye cover crop. It looks like the cabbage is taking a beating, but in fact, cabbage is tough and we had very little damage to the crop. This is the second cultivation, which occurred about 20 days after transplanting. You can see that the fingers shed residue pretty well, although every four or 500 row feet, we had to jump off and untangle the rye. The fingers vary in a couple ways. Uh, the diameter of the fingers themselves, um, which really is the choice depends on what your spacing is for your crop. So if you have a narrow spaced crop, you'd put you choose the smaller diameter fingers. For a larger crop, obviously larger fingers. The other key thing is the diameter of the tines. For a given finger diameter, smaller tines are going to cause the tips of the fingers to move faster relative to the tractor speed. And so Steckety style, the tines are fairly similar diameter to the fingers, and so the tips will not travel very much different than the tractor speed. Versus some of the other models, this is a Garford, and the same as two of Crest, there's a, a smaller diameter tine, so the fingers will move faster. And that's important, particularly for some of the horse-drawn applications or a walk behind tractors where you're limited in how fast you can go. If you choose an implement with a narrower diameter, it'll give you more action for a given speed. The other difference between these is uh, the durometer, the hardness of the rubber, 
you can kind of pinch and feel differences. Uh, the harder it is, the more aggressive it will be. So for some of the heavier clay soils, you'd probably choose the harder durometer versus uh, sandy soils or more tender crops, you might go with something like this, a little uh, more flexible. We have mostly worked with rear mounted finger weeders on a steerable toolbar. And in that case, uh, we have a floating arm. So this, when it's set in the soil, floats and the fingers kind of self-regulate their depth and move with the contours in the field. The other setup is uh, belly mounted. Uh, many growers are using Alice Chalmer G's or other uh, cultivating tractors where the tools are mounted in front. And in that case, you have limited space typically, so you can't use these floating arms and it's more typical to try to do a parallel linkage of some kind. Some growers will use sweeps or knives in front to loosen the soil in front of the finger. Uh, in other cases, particularly if you have residue or something that might normally get caught up in the knives, we'd go with some kind of a rolling cultivator, like a Lilliston cultivator, or this is a star hoe uh, that is also pretty handy for loosening the soil in front of the fingers. Depending on the crop, near row tools like cutaway discs or budding basket weeders can be useful for creating a narrow in-row strip for the finger weeder. In carrots, we use cutaway discs and then the fingers are used to first shatter the in-row zone and bury small weeds. Les Roganbuck, of our Michigan grower collaborators, has finger weeders belly mounted on his Alice Chalmers G. Before finger weeding, he uses alloway cutaway discs to kill weeds near the crop row leaving a narrow, undisturbed in-row band that will then get finger weeded. After Les used the cutaway disc, here's what his sugar beets looked like. You can see the undisturbed, narrow in-row zone with various small annual grass and broadleaf weeds. Notice that the beets are two to three inches tall, and the weeds are for the most part shorter than the crop. You can see a couple larger wild radish weeds that escaped bed preparation and will be difficult to control using the finger weeder. But you can also see small purslane, lamb's quarters, eastern black nightshade, and a pigweed in the in-row zone. Now, let's look at the adjacent row that got finger weeded. You can see that the finger weeder clipped the roots of some of the sugar beets, causing wilting, but it also effectively buried the small weeds. Note, however, that the large, well-rooted wild radish was untouched by the finger and will require hand weeding. A couple other adjustments on the finger weeder with this setup. One of the first things you want to do is set the depth of the wheels that are used for steering. If I raise the wheel, it lowers the setting of the fingers on the soil. And so we want to aim for the fingers being relatively flat, and then we can adjust uh, with the down pressure of the finger itself, either by turning this spring to get more down pressure. Some growers will also use a hydraulic top link and pull in a little bit on the top link to raise the fingers out, or push out a little on the top link to push the fingers in a little deeper. And that's helpful for adjusting on the fly if you have different soil conditions as you're going through the field. One of the problems with that is you might change how your sweeps are running through the field and, and those might get a little bit out of alignment. But for fine tune adjustments, that hydraulic top link can be a useful method for calibrating as well. So for tender crops, one other adjustment you can make to the finger weeders to make them a little bit less aggressive is to offset the fingers so they're not directly across from each other, but separated by a little bit. And that gets a little less aggressive on, on tender crops. With our system, you can just flip it uh, on the, single uh, toolbar. With the Steckity system, they're actually independent units and they're often configured that way so that each arm can be put at whatever distance apart you want. These uh, finger weeders, some of them are together and some of them are offset. What's the difference between having the fingers together or offset? Yes, we have the finger weeders. We can move them, we can set them next to each other or an offset, Okay. and we can adjust how far the fingers are going into the row. Right. And of course, it has to do with the strongness, how strong the plants are. Okay. When the plants are very weak, we put the finger weeders in offset. And when the plants are stronger, uh, we can put them next to each other. 
to each other. Okay, and also move into each other, and we get more pressure on it. Okay, so the finger wheels will work very aggressive. The most widely used systems are made by the German company called Kress and Dutch company Stekety, who share the European patent for finger weeders. Other manufacturers include the British company Garford, and most recently Tilmore, which has begun producing finger weeders in Ohio, USA. It's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Gerkink. She's one of the uh, farmer collaborators on our SARE project. She's the production manager at the Student Organic Farm here at Michigan State University. And to start off, I'm just going to ask Sarah what, how she set the finger weeder up this season and kind of what crops you ran it through and that kind of overview. We use the Tillmore finger weeders um, under, belly mounted under Alice Chalmers G. Um, we cultivated, transplanted coal crops with it. Um, so broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts and the like. And we set it up so that there were goose foot sweeps on either side of the bed as well and in the middle just to get a more coverage. And how did you mount it to the toolbar? Did you have some kind of floating arm or parallel linkage or how did you do that? We mounted it to a hawk parallel linkage. That was really nice because it's pretty compact and it's tight space under the G and we were able to move, move the fingers with the contour of the soil. Our fields aren't always perfectly flat. Anything that you particularly liked about the tool that you'd want to share? I thought it was a really nice tool to thoroughly get the in-row weeds. Uh, we overlapped the fingers so that they would hit the crop, but the crop was not damaged by it because it had a robust enough sort of body and root system. But it took all the weeds from inside of the row. Any problems or challenges that you had or things you might do differently? The G has a really limited amount of space in the, uh, underneath it, so maybe an extended G would have been better or some taller and more spacious underbelly of a, cult a different cultivating tractor. One thing that I realized in one of the last times I tried it was that having sweeps or something that will move soil a little bit uh, in front of the fingers gives some loose soil for the fingers to flick um, and do a little bit of hilling and cover the weeds. You mentioned under the right conditions, are there certain soil types or uh, moisture levels that you've found worked better than others? Sure. We have pretty heavy clay soils at our farm, so when the soil is really, really dry, we have clumps and clods that can hang on to the weeds even after they've been flicked off. So the weeds can just wait until the next rain and be fine after that. So I found that a little bit of moisture was really helpful. Um, it was great to, it, it allowed us to break up that soil, but not, not so much moisture that the weeds would survive after weeding. And were there any particular types of weeds that you found it was more effective on than others, broadleaves, grasses, or anything you noticed there? Uh, mainly annual broadleaf weeds and annual grasses uh, it was really good at. Perennial grasses are just yeah. impossible. Thank you very much, Sarah, for being part of our project, and good luck working with the finger weeder in the future. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching this video on the finger weeder. Please be sure to see our other videos on in-row cultivation tools, profiling the torsion weeder and flex time cultivator. Thank you to our farmer partners, both in the US and Europe, who shared knowledge and learned with us. A big thanks to our manufacturing and sales partners who informed us on the design and function of the machines we used throughout the project. Thank you to all the participants and organizers of the European Physical and Cultural Weed Control Working Group and the researchers at Wageningen University and Research. And of course, thank you to our funding partners and Michigan State University faculty and staff.